perception, uh, but I want to situate the discussion historically. Uh, there are certain truly disastrous mistakes in Western philosophy, and once the mistake is off and running, it tends to color philosophical investigation for literally centuries. Now, the worst mistake of all is called dualism, uh, because it says the word reality divides into two, uh, the physical and the mental. And dualism uh, trades off uh, with its opposite, which is called materialism. And materialism is just as bad. It makes the same dumb mistake, because it thinks, well, if you grant the reality of the mental, you've got to grant dualism, and that's a disaster, so we'll deny the reality of the mental. And that is uh, 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 such a ridiculous mistake, I'm embarrassed to expound it, but I'll do that tomorrow. That's number one mistake. Now, there's a second mistake that's almost as bad, uh, and that colored epistemology for the past 350 years. And that's the mistake of supposing you can never see objects and states of affairs in the real world. So if I look at my hand in front of my face, what do I actually see? Well, I think I, I see my hand. I, and I'll draw you the picture. I'm not good at drawing pictures, but here's what it looks like. Here's this guy. He's got an eye. And there's an object here. It won't be a hand because I can't draw a hand. Uh, but he sees the object. Now, I think that is the correct picture. That picture is denied by everybody. And I'm going to tell you the argument on the basis of which they deny it. And it's so bad, I don't know, I have to have a name for it. I'm going to call it the bad argument with a capital B A. Here's how it goes. Now, you say you saw your hand. Aha! But suppose you were having a hallucination. Suppose you're having a hallucination. Well, if you're having a hallucination, you did see something, right? You saw something. You just didn't see a hand. But since the hallucination is absolutely indistinguishable from seeing a real hand, then you have to give the same analysis of the, this case, the so-called veridical case or good case, that you give of the hallucination. So let's go through that. In the case of the hallucination, you saw something, but not a hand. We'll get a name for it, and in uh, Descartes, and in Locke, it's called an idea. You saw an idea of a hand. In Hume, it's called an impression. And in the 20th century, it came to be called a sense data, plural sense data. But now, since it's indistinguishable from the veridical or good case, you have to give the same analysis in the veridical or the good case that you gave of the bad case. And you have to say, well, then even when you're not having hallucin hallucination, all you can ever see is a sense data. Data. You know, the argument goes, you're aware of something. You're aware of the same thing in both cases, but it's not a hand in the bad case, no, it can't be a hand in the good case. And then you've got a problem. What's the relation between the thing you do see, the thing in your head, or as the, the, the Cartesians would have to say, in your mind, and the thing you don't see, which is the object out there. What you actually see is this thing in here, which is a sense datum. And once you have that move, you can't see objects in the world. You can only see ideas, impressions, or sense data. Then you have a horrendous problem. What's the relationship between the sense data that you do see and the object that you don't see? Now, I hope that argument seems to you bad that says you can never see objects because in the hallucination case you don't see the object and the hallucination is indistinguishable from really seeing an object. But that fallacy has several well-known names, just for a start. Uh, Descartes, Locke, Barclay, Hume, Leibniz, Spinoza, Kant, not to mention um, uh, John Stuart Mill, and I'd say Hegel, but I can't understand Hegel, but I think he probably made the same mistake as everybody else did. Uh, and, uh, once you have, once you've made that mistake, then you have this horrible question. What's the relation between the sense data that you do see and the object you don't see? And the answers to that question really define epistemology for about 300 years. Uh, the answer given by Descartes and Locke is, well, it's true, you can't see the object, 
but you see a picture of the object. This is kind of representation of the object, and that's called the representative theory of perception, or sometimes representative realism. But now, Markley looked at that and said, but that's crazy. You can't say this thing resembles that thing, because by definition, that thing is invisible. I mean, you see, the representation derives from resemblance, but two things can't resemble if one is absolutely invisible. If a guy said, I've got two cars in my garage that look exactly alike, except the one on the left is invisible, <laughs> you know he's making a mistake. I now Barclay put that by saying an idea can resemble only another idea. Now you might think, well, it'd be nice then if Barclay had gone back to this picture, which I'll call naive realism, uh, but he didn't. He did something really radical with catastrophic results. He got rid of all of this and said, all you can ever see is in this thing. And indeed, we should get rid of that. <laughs> That's an actual material object. And on this view, there aren't any material objects. So you now have a choice. You've either got the representative theory of perception, which hasn't got a chance, for reasons Barclay pointed out, or you've got the worst possible uh, theory, and it's called idealism. Uh, and I have to tell you, uh, this country is famous uh, for uh, <laughs> perpetuating a large number of ideas for reasons that are, seem utterly mysterious to me. Most of them have names that start with H. I won't tell you <laughs> all of their names. But uh, there are a whole lot of them out there. Okay, now, there are two versions of idealism. There's the there's the, uh, the big deal idealism, and then there's a more modest version called phenomenalism that says really empirical reality reduces to the phenomena of sense data. Uh, but I think they come out to pretty much uh, the same basic view. Namely, you can't see independently existing objects and states of affairs. All you can ever perceive are sense data in your mind. Okay, what's wrong with the argument? I said it's a bad argument. And the fallacy in the argument is so obvious it's so screamingly obvious, and I'm amazed uh, that these guys got away with it for literally centuries. But here's the fallacy in the argument. In the good or veridical case, I'm aware of something. In the bad or hallucinatory case, I'm also aware of something. Uh, but since they're indistinguishable, I have to say I'm aware of the same thing in both cases. Okay, has everybody got that? That's the argument. Now, the problem is that's a pun on aware of. There are two senses of aware of. And hence, the, the fallacy is one of the simplest fallacies in, in logic. It's a fallacy of ambiguity. Let me illustrate it with an obvious example. If I push really hard against this table, I'm aware of the table, but I'm also aware of a sensation in my hand, but only having one awareness, so then it looks like, well, the table is really a sensation in my hand. That was Barclay's argument. I want to say that is a pun. That's a fallacy of ambiguity on aware of. There are two senses of aware of. One sense of aware of is one of intentionality, where there's an object. I'm aware of the table. And in the other, I'm aware of a sensation. But in the case of a sensation, the sensation equals the awareness. They're identical. That's the constitutive sense of aware of. In this case, this is the intentionalistic sense of aware of, where there is an object of the awareness that's not identical with the awareness. But when, the, in the sense in which I'm aware of a sensation, the sensation and the awareness are identical. But in the case where I'm aware of the table, it's the same case, because it's the same experience, there is a non-identity between the awareness and the table, because the table is the intentional object. It's the object that I'm aware of. So I think this simple ambiguity I underlies an awful lot of bad philosophy. I can't tell you how much. Uh, now, you might think, well, that's old stuff. If the thing is repeated to this day in a variation on the argument, it's called the argument from science. And a lot of very good scientists believe this. I mean, Francis Crick did and Christoph Koch. And here's how the argument goes. Science has shown that you don't actually see objects and states of affairs, what you see is the effect that objects and states of affairs have on your nervous system. And what they do on your nervous system is produce somewhere in the brain, uh, presumably in the, uh, in the cortex, 
they produce a conscious visual experience, and that's all you actually see. You don't see the real world. That's pre-scientific to see that you uh, to believe that you see the real world. What you see is the impact of the real world on your nervous system. Now, I hope it's clear that's the same mistake. The fact that we can show how a, a, we can show with a scientific analysis of vision that the impact of the photo of the photons on the photoreceptor cells of the retina eventually produce a visual experience doesn't show that the visual experience is the object of perception. It's the same mistake uh, as uh, the bad argument. Uh, so I call both the bad argument and use the bad argument as a name for any argument that denies that we actually see objects and states of affairs in the world, which uh, is sometimes called direct realism or naive realism. All these uh, terms are used somewhat uh, unsystematically, so I'll just call it direct realism. Okay, so that's the bad argument, and I think if you make the bad argument, you're off and running. Well, here they go with uh, Descartes, uh, uh, Barclay and Hume, Leibniz, Spinoza, and then Kant is quite interesting because he says if you don't accept uh, the rejection of naive realism, if you think that somehow there, you can perceive objects and states of affairs in the world that have a totally independent existence of us, then you can't do uh, transcendental idealism. You can't do transcendental philosophy, because transcendental philosophy has to show how not that our perceptual experiences are responsible to objects in the world, but rather objects in the world are responsible to our cognitive apparatus, and you're all familiar with that. That's transcendental idealism. All right, now I am now going to present you with an alternative view, which is a view I call direct realism, uh, and that's the view uh, that says we do directly perceive objects and states of affairs in the world. How does it work? How is that possible? What's the form of the intentionality? And I'm going to draw the picture with a little more complexity, because here's how it goes. According to the picture that I have, the object reflects light, and, and the light hits the photoreceptor cells, the retina, and then stimulates a whole lot of things I won't tell you about involving the optic nerve and the chiasma and the lateral geniculate nucleus and all the, uh, the visual areas. And the whole thing eventually causes a visual experience. And I'm just going to call it a visual experience. Now, this relation is causal. There's a series of causal events by which the object causes a visual experience. But the visual experience itself gives you a direct presentation of objects and states of affairs because the visual experience has intentionality and the object, the presence of the object, is the condition of satisfaction of the visual experience. So you have a causal relation from the object to the visual experience and an intentional relation from the visual experience to the object itself. And I want to tell you how that intentionality works because it's absolutely fascinating. Now, the single most important thing I'm going to tell you in this lecture I'm going to, is I'm going to tell you right now. You cannot see the visual experience. Not because it's invisible, because it is the seeing. You see, this is what was the wrong with the bad argument. They tried to make the seeing of an object in itself, uh, they try to make the seeing into the object seen. You can't, and so when I hit the table, one thing I cannot hit is the hitting. Not because it's so hard to hit, but because it's a category mistake to think you can hit the hitting. Now you can't see the seeing, and this is the seeing of the object. So this is not itself seen because it is the seeing. Well, then how do you draw the hallucination case? What does the hallucination case look like? Well, it looks like this. In the hallucination case, you have the same guy, and he's got this visual experience, but the visual experience isn't caused by an object out there. It's caused by inner causes. It's caused by something wrong with his nervous system. So this is the hallucination case. You have the same visual experience, but the mistake is to suppose that something is seen in both cases 
And the answer is, in this case, nothing is seen, because there's nothing out there. In this case, an object is seen, but you do not see the seeing of the object. The seeing of the object is not itself an object of perception. Uh, that's, in a way, one of the most important things I want to tell you. So, uh, this is a seminar, and not a lecture, so let's stop and take questions about that. I want everybody to get this point, that for 300 years, at least, Western philosophy, Western epistemology, has been dominated by a wrong model, and it's based on a single bad argument that is itself based on a pun, based on two senses of see or aware of, and the idea is that in the good case and the bad case, you're aware of something, but the awareness in the bad case is not of an object, but of a sense datum, and since the two are indistinguishable, you have to say, you're never aware of objects, you're only aware of sense data. And I'm saying that's a fallacy. It rests on a fallacy of ambiguity over the notion of aware of. So if you accept, as I do, a realistic conception of perception, you can grant that these are identical, and grant that in this case you don't see anything, in this case you do see something, but whatever you see, in neither case do you see the visual experience. The visual experience is not itself an object of perception, it is itself the perceiving, it is the seeing. Okay, let's take questions about that. It's not, not going on, and it's getting more complicated, but this is the negative or polemical part of this talk. So any questions about that? If you understand that, uh, then I think we go through, it's kind of fun uh, to go through all these old guys and see how they make this mistake. Uh, Hume, I, I love Hume because he's so incredibly intelligent and arrogant. Uh, and what he says is, if you're tempted to naive realism, here's a simple refutation, push one eyeball. If you push one eyeball on the Niagara's view, the world would double. There'd be twice as many people in this room. But there aren't twice as many, therefore you never see objects and states of affairs. All you see are your own experiences. I hope it's obvious that that's the same mistake. Uh, what happens when you push one eyeball? If you have two of these lines coming out of here, uh, but you don't see uh, twice as many things, you just see one thing, and you see a double. Anytime you want to do this, it is an experiment, uh, focus your eye on the back wall, and you will notice your, you see your finger double if you hold it up like this. And you can see there aren't really two fingers, because you can coalesce uh, the two images into one, but you do not see the images. What you see is a finger, and you see a double, and in seeing the finger, you have two images, but you don't see the images. Okay, yeah, let's take a question about that, yeah. Perhaps you could, us, could tell us some more about the status of this scene, of yeah. the act. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, there has to be some way of representation, because the exterior object has a physical structure that is different from the physical structure of uh, my organism. Yeah. So, um, be it that uh, this is represented in the way nerves are firing or something, yeah. you have to distinguish between two things that are going on inside me. Yeah. The physical state yeah. uh, and the object that I perceive. Right. So, how uh, exactly is uh, the relation between these two, okay. the subjective and the objective? Yeah, M much of this lecture will be about, oh you know, sorry, I don't need that, I got my own. <laughs> so much of this lecture will be about that question. In your head is a visual experience which is ontologically subjective. I'm sorry to use big words, it just means it only exists in so far as it's experienced. Outside of here, is an object that's ontologically, and this is ontologically subjective, this one here is ontologically objective. This one, this means, has an existence independently of being perceived, and this one exists only insofar as it's experience. It is itself an experience. What's the relation between the visual experience inside your head, and remember it comes as part of a total visual field, as a total conscious field, and the object and state of affairs in the world of which this is a perception. And that question becomes even more pressing when you reflect on the fact that the description of the visual experience and the description of the object is pretty much the same. Same words in the same order. What do you see? I, I see a piece of chalk with paper wrapped around it. 
That's the, what I see. Now, what's the visual experience? Well, it's the visual experience of having an experience exactly as if I were seeing a piece of chalk with paper wrapped around it. Now, how can those be pretty much exactly the same? And there are a, a series of people who are impressed by this identity of the description to think, well, maybe there aren't two things. Maybe there's just one thing, because the description is the same. And they, they have an awful name. They're called disjunctivists. It sounds like an eye disease, but in fact, <laughs> uh, uh, they think there's a disjunction between the hallucination and, uh, uh, and the bad, the good case, because there can't be anything in common, and they think if there was something in common, then it, you'd be uh, back in the bad argument you'd be having forced to say that all you can ever see are your own sense data. Okay, I'm, I'm going to put off answering that because that's what much of this talk is about. The short answer, in one sense, is this entity here has intrinsic intentionality. You can't have that experience without it seeming to you that you are seeing a piece of chalk in your hand. And that's internal to its being that particular experience. It couldn't be that experience if it wasn't an experience of seeming to see a piece of chalk. Now, how does that work? Well, I'm getting to that, one at a time. Okay, other questions at this point. What I've done so far is just establish that there is a bad argument in the West history of Western philosophy, and I don't know how far back it goes. It's certainly in everybody from Descartes on, and I'm not enough of a scholar to know if it's in the Greeks as well, but somebody will no doubt tell me. Uh, my guess is it's probably in Greek philosophers as well, uh, because I doubt if we really thought of it. I mean, an awful lot of Descartes is, is in St. Augustine, and maybe this is in St. Augustine too. Uh, but the important thing to see is this is never seen because it is the seeing. And in the case of a hallucination, nothing is seen. Nothing at all in the, in the object line of business. Rather, you have an experience which is exactly as if you were seeing something. Okay, other questions? Any, that was a good one, yeah. And you need a mic. So just continuing the same point, could you supply uh, a definition of ontologically subjective? Yes, I should have done that, but I, I, let me take it, I, let me get it clear. Whenever you have conscious experiences, these experiences only exist insofar as they are experienced. Uh, and in that respect, they differ from objects and states of affairs in the world. Now, the notions of objectivity and subjectivity are such a big deal in our intellectual culture, but they suffer from a horrendous ambiguity. There is an epistemic sense of the objective-subjective distinction, where epistemic means having to do with knowledge. And there, what is objective and subjective are claims. So if I say, uh, Van Gogh died in France, that is epistemically objective, because you can settle that as a matter of fact. I mean, it's a, it's a matter of fact. But if I say, uh, Van Gogh was a better painter than Gauguin, well, that, as they say, is a matter of opinion. I think it's right, but it's a sub matter of subjective opinion. So that's the distinction between what is epistemically objective and subjective. Uh, and those, that's an objective claim and a subjective claim. But there's another sense of the objective-subjective distinction which is not epistemic, but ontological. There are some entities that have an existence totally independent of human or animal experiences. Mountains, molecules, and tectonic plates don't give a damn about us. They exist regardless of what we think. But pains and tickles and itches only exist insofar as they are experienced. So mountains, molecules, and tectonic plates have an ontologically objective existence Pains and tickles and itches have an ontologically subjective existence. Now, the reason this is so important is that a lot of people think if you have a domain that's subjective, you can never have a science of that domain because science is objective. That's a bad pun. I used to hear from these guys, the, the brain stabbers, the neurobiologists, that you couldn't have a science of consciousness because consciousness is subjective and science is objective. That's a bad pun. Uh, science is indeed epistemically objective. You try to get claims that are independent of the attitudes and feelings of the scientist. But the epistemic objectivity of the, of the theory does not prevent you from having a, an epistemically 
objective study of a domain that's ontologically subjective. You can have a domain that's ontologically subjective, like the consciousness going on in your head, and yet you can give a scientific account of that domain, which is epistemically objective. Now, the reason that that's important for this discussion is that this stuff in here is ontologically subjective. It exists only insofar as it's experienced. And yet, this stuff out here is ontologically objective. It has an, a, a form of existence that's totally independent of being experienced. Are you with me so far? Now, there's a single sentence that describes the relationship between this and this, but I'm going to, it's going to take me several paragraphs to tell it in detail. And that is, this thing in here gives you a presentation of objects out here. And this is why the description has to be the same. I'd say, I have a visual experience, uh, which is exactly as if I were seeing a piece of chalk that describes the ontologically subjective visual experience, and then I'm actually seeing a piece of chalk that describes the ob ontologically objective uh, entity that, that, that I am perceiving. Same description, but two different ontological statuses. The connection is this. This thing has intentionality. There's no way I could be having this experience without it seeming to me that I'm seeing objects, and that's the mark of intentionality. That intentionality always has conditions of satisfaction. If I intend to go to the movies, then that's satisfied only if I go to the movies. Uh, if I uh, believe that it's raining, that's satisfied only if it's raining. So every time you have an intentional state, and the intentional states have this kind of structure, where you have a propositional content, and a certain mode or type that the state is in, a belief, a desire, or hope, a fear, or a visual perception, or an intention in action, and that determines the, uh, this determines the condition of satisfaction of the intentional state, and this determines what kind of intentional state it is, and what sort of direction of fit it has to the world, either that direction of fit, or that direction of fit. Okay, uh, with me so far, I'm going fast, but you're all, uh, I think, an awful lot of philosophers here, you're probably familiar with most of, most of this. All right, but now we owe, owe you an explanation. Well, what exactly is the relationship between this thing and that thing that enables us to get knowledge of this thing based on having that experience? And that is a desperately important question in the history of philosophy because the version I gave you earlier makes skepticism inevitable and unanswerable because the, ver the, the bad argument says you can never see objects out there. All you can ever see is what's going on in your mind. And then you've got a question, well, how can you know if there's anything out there if all you can ever perceive is the contents of your own mind? Now, the desperate answer to that is to say, well, you can overcome skepticism if you just say nothing exists except what's in your mind. And, of course, that's a desperate answer because now you deny the existence of any ontologically objective world. But right now we're at the state where we've got an ontologically subjective series of experiences in our head and an ontologically objective series of events and states of affairs in the world. And the subjective gives you a direct presentation of the objective. And I'm now going to explain how that works. Okay, so let's go through that. What The, the typical account of intentionality is, to, I mean, everybody's familiar with this piece of jargon, intentionality uh, it just means the way that the mind is directed at objects and states of affairs in the world. It's an unfortunate word for English speakers because it makes it look like there's some special connection with intending, but Germans don't have a problem with that because intentionality does not sound like absicht uh, in a way that in intending does sound like intentionality. So intending, in which in the sense in which I intend to go to the movies, that's just one kind of intentionality, among others, along with belief, belief hope, fear, desire, uh, love and hate, and all the rest of it. Now, what is interesting, however, is that these typical intentional states, like belief and desire, are best thought of as representations. And what they represent is what is called their conditions of satisfaction. So, if I believe it's raining, then my belief will be satisfied only if it's raining. Everybody got that? The belief represents the state of affairs that it's raining. Uh, if I desire uh, to marry a Republican, then the state of our affairs represented is that I marry a Republican, and my desire will be satisfied only if I marry a Republican. So the key to understanding intentionality 
is think of intentional states as representing how things are in the world, or how we'd like them to be, or how we intend to make them be. And in all those cases, we we'll just generalize that and say, the intentional state represents its conditions of satisfaction. Okay, what is special about perceptual experience is that it's wrong to think of it as a representation, because the connection between the conscious experience and the object and states of affairs in the world is too immediate and too direct. And I want to say it is a presentation and not just a representation. Well, what does that mean to say it's a presentation? Well, let's go through some of the features. First of all, in the case of percep conscious perceptual experience, I, you have to have a kind of immediate consciousness of the object you are seeing. I'll use, just use Freud's abbreviation, CS for consciousness. But secondly, you experience the object you are perceiving, and this is much true of other modalities besides uh, just um, uh, vision, you perceive it as causing your perception of it. That is, you perceive this thing in here as caused by an object out there. What's the proof of that? Well, the simplest argument for that is, imagine a case where you don't actually know what it is that you're perceiving. Uh, you walk into a dark room and you stumble over something, or you hear a loud noise, or you see a sudden flash at the window. In every case, one thing you do know, you know that the object you perceived, whatever it was, was the thing that caused your perception of it. Perceptions come to us as caused by their conditions of satisfaction. And that's going to be essential to understanding the intentionality of perception. There's a direct causal connection between the perceptual experience and the object and states or state of affairs that you're actually perceiving. Now, since you perceive it, you have your experience as caused by the object and states of affairs that you are perceiving, you get a curious kind of indexicality to the perception. See, notice these are not true of intentional states generally. If you take a belief or a desire, it needn't be conscious. I have lots of beliefs I'm not thinking about now, like the belief that George Washington was the first president. I have that belief even when I'm sound asleep. I don't have to be thinking about it. But if I'm having a visual experience, it has to be conscious, and it has to be caused by the object of state affairs that I'm perceiving. Otherwise, it's defective. Otherwise, it's, for example, a hallucination. But now there's a third feature, and that is all perception, I would take visual perception because it's the most common case, is of the here and the now. You see, uh, in, in the case of beliefs and desires, you can tear them loose from uh, their conditions of satisfaction. And I can have beliefs about events uh, that occurred long ago, or events that may occur in the future, and the same with desires. Uh, you can, as Descartes says, uh, desires are potentially infinite, there are no limits to the things you can desire. But in the case of perceptions, all of your perceptions are of the here and the now, because you have this presentational intentionality, it's presented to you as something happening right here and now. And that's true even if you know it's not here and now. That is, if you see a uh, star that ceased to exist uh, 10 million years ago, and you know that it ceased to exist 10 million years ago, all the same you're seeing it as if uh, it were here and now, because that's characteristic of perceptual intentionality. It has this indexicality. There's an interesting book by Roland Bach called Camera Lucida, and he says all um, uh, uh, photographs have the same knowing, that's a Husserlian jargon, just means conditions of satisfaction. They all have the uh, condition of satisfaction, this event actually occurred. And this is why we feel there's something specially cheating about fiddling with photographs. Now, with the advent of digitalization, we're losing that. I mean, now nobody believes photographs the way they used to in the old days when they had uh, cameras, uh, which, well, you couldn't mess around the way you can uh, with Photoshop. 
But uh, what he's driving at is that it's part of the condition of satisfaction of the photograph that it should represent a state of affairs that actually occurred. And it's part of the condition of satisfaction of your presentational intentionality when you actually see something. It's part of the condition of satisfaction that you're perceiving something here and now. And that's why it has a fourth feature. It's non-detachable. Uh, in the case of representations like maps and photographs and diagrams and, and uh, beliefs, you can tear them loose from their condition of satisfaction and mess around with them. You can imagine it this way or that way, but when you're actually seeing something, you cannot detach the experience uh, from the object that you are perceiving. There, there's a direct causal connection between the object that you are perceiving and the conscious perception you're having of it. So you don't get the normal detachability that you get with representations. Uh, you have the direct causal presentation makes it, uh, you can't break the connection between the object and uh, the experience you're having. And this, is, by the way, is a, is a feature of the phenomenology. Is this is true even if, if it's a hallucination, and even if you know it's a hallucination, still you experience it as essentially tied to its... You, you have the experience as essentially tied to the conditions of satisfaction. Well, I could go on with this list. There's another feature of perceptual experience which you don't get with representations, and that is they have a kind of continuousness. You see, if you think of beliefs, they're sort of discrete. You can have one belief followed by another belief. Uh, they're separable. But in the case of your visual experiences, there's a continuous flow of one into another throughout your waking life. The experience of the qualitative subjectivity in the head is a continuous presentation of objects and states of affairs in the world. Uh, vision is a miraculous uh, feature of the world, and I think it must be horrible to be blind, because one of the great pleasures in life, which we, I mean, along with sex and great food and, and uh, good beer in, in Cologne, uh, is vision. And we don't celebrate it, we do the other things, because we sort of take it for granted. We're seeing things all day long. But it is an enormous, it is a form of, uh, for me at least, of ecstatic pleasure. I'm an augen mensch, as we say in English. Uh, and, and that means whenever I go to a new town, I want to go to the art museum or whatever. And I, 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 I can't live in places that aren't beautiful. And fortunately, Berkeley is very beautiful. And when I get bored with that, I go down to the beach house or up to the mountains. Okay, but anyway, I'm digressing. The point I'm making now is that it's characteristic of the presentational intentionality of perception, unlike the intentionality that you get in beliefs and desires or the derived intentionality that you get in sentences. You see, sentences are discrete. You used to get one sentence and then you get another sentence. But visual experiences are continuous. They just keep going on. Okay, I could go on with this list, but I want to emphasize it's conscious, it's experience as causal. That's crucial. Uh, it's indexical, it's always of the here and the now, even when you know that it's wrong. It's not detachable, the experience from its condition of satisfaction, and there's a continuity. Let's take questions about that, because now I'm going to go to the next part of this lecture, which is the hardest part, and I'm not very satisfied with it, but you can help me with it. Thomas. You said that uh, you experience something as the cause of your Absolutely, yes. I mean, does it mean that experience is always propositional, conceptual, because okay. you need them the concept of a course? Yeah. And it seems that my kids, before they acquire the concept of a course, were able to see that, I don't know, yeah. new things were in front of them. And so okay. And so on. Uh, my test for any theory of perception is, does it apply to Tarski? Tarski's my dog. Uh, and I think there's no question that this, that Tarski has his perceptual experiences as causal, conscious, indexical, so always a here and now, and non-detachable and continuous. Now what about the causal component? Well, I said the two great mistakes in Western philosophy were dualism and the theory of perception. The third greatest mistake is the conception that we have of causation, and we get it from Hume, and it's a, a terrible mistake. 
that, that you can never directly experience the causal relation, that causal statements are always uh, 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 make implicit reference to constant conjunction or universal laws. Uh, this isn't a lecture about uh, causation, so I promise you I won't bore you with causation, but it is a standard mistake. But I think it's clear that we do experience, uh, we have our perceptual experience as caused by the uh, objects that we are perceiving. And one way to see that is to imagine that you could form images which were so vivid that they were just as vivid as actually seeing something. All the same, the experience would be totally different. I now form a vivid image of the Eiffel Tower in Paris. There it is, rising above the trees. And it's just as vivid as actually seeing the Eiffel Tower, but there's a huge difference. Because the image I experience as caused by me but the actual visual experience of seeing the Eiffel Tower, I experience as caused by the Eiffel Tower. And that's one argument. The other argument I gave you earlier is to says, uh, was to say, imagine a case where you don't know what you're perceiving. Suddenly there's a flash uh, on the window, or suddenly there's a loud noise, or there's an awful smell. I, I mean, pick your favorite experience. In every case, you know one thing. Even if you don't know what it was, what it is that you perceived, was the thing that caused your visual experience. So there is, a, a, there is an experience connection between seeing something, or otherwise perceiving it, uh, and the causal relation between uh, the object that you're seeing and the visual experience you have of seeing it. Now I think this works for animals and small children, because if you watch Tarski chasing a cat, or digging for a bone, you'll notice there's a terrifically a complex cause a set of coordination between his perceptual experiences and his intentional actions. And uh, there's a, a constant series of causal experiences that he has. He's causing things happen when he digs for the bone, and then he's having visual experience caused by the objects that he's seeing, and when he detects that he's made a mistake, he's barking at the cat up that tree, and he suddenly sees she's over there in that tree, then he quits barking here and goes barking over there. So the, the experience comes to you with causation built into the experience. When I wrote a book about this called Intentionality, a lot of people criticized, well, the analysis is too complex for uh, children and animals. Well, the idea is not children and animals are thinking all this analysis. No, it's just that's what's going on in their experience. Their experience contains a causal component. I mean, if I say knowledge is justified true belief uh, that avoids the Getty or counterexamples, <laughs> I, and I say, uh, Tarski knows that someone is at the door. I'm not saying, Tarski is thinking, I have a justified true belief that avoids the Ed Getty or counterexamples. He's not thinking that at all. He just knows someone is at the door. So don't confuse the, the actual character of the experience with the philosophical characterization of the experience. The animal doesn't have to have the, be able to reflect about causation in order to have the experience of causation. I mean, I, I, I could say a whole lot more about that, but I think maybe that's enough. Uh, okay, now, I want to, well, let's take one question here, because I now want to go to the uh, most difficult part, and the part I'm least satisfied with. All right, um, you said that every visual experience needs to be conscious. Um, I was wondering, what's your analysis of cases like sleepwalking, for example, yeah. or absent-minded car driving, or yeah. even strange cases like blindness denial? Or phenomenon like that. Yeah. Well, you get all these interesting pathological uh, cases. Um, what should we say about blind sight, uh, for example? See, I'm talking about conscious visual experience. Now, as everybody knows what blind sight is, there was a uh, there's a, a guy in uh, Oxford, uh, Larry Weisskrantz, uh, and he uh, discovered a patient who was able to identify objects and states of affairs without being aware that he was perceiving them. So in, in that case, uh, the guy, you know, what you do is you tell him, focus your eyes here. He had, the, the guy in question had damaged the visual area of one. He got run over by a truck when he was 10 years old. Uh, and he had damaged the visual area of one. You tell him, focus your eyes here. And then you flash an X or an O and you ask him, what did you see? You flash it so fast that he can't shift his eyes. You ask him, what do you see? And the subjects usually become irritated. They say, you know I can't see anything there because of my brain damage. 
And they say, well, make a guess. Or tell us what it seems like. And the guy says, well, it seems like there was an X. Or it seems like there was an O. And the amazing thing is, the guy was getting it right 95% of the time. It was clearly not chance. And the guy was amazed at the end of the week when they did this, when they told him, you were right 95% of the time. How did you do it? And the guy said, I don't know. I couldn't see a damn thing. I said, you know, I'm quoting verbatim from what the guy said. All right, now what Larry uh, Weisman uh, inferred from that is there must be two visual systems. And some other uh, people like Milner and Goodell say, well, there are more than two, and they're not all conscious. So we have to allow for those cases. So that's a famous kind of case where you have a pathological case where the guy can report a visual awareness without reporting any consciousness. Of, uh, can report, let me state it carefully, can report events occurring in his visual field, in his, in his objective visual field, without reporting any visual awareness of those events. And that shows that you can have visual intentionality, which is not conscious. On the other hand, it's very limited. I mean, the guy couldn't uh, drive to Munich uh, from here uh, using only blindsight. Uh, no, you got it. You'd be able to see more than, uh, than uh, he had. Or he couldn't do impressionist painting. So these are pathological cases where uh, the guy has a severe limitations on his normal perception. And there are lots of cases like that. Now, I, I'm not convinced by David Armstrong's example of the guy who comes to while driving, because I do a lot of long driving too, and it's just a matter of shifting your attention. It isn't the case that I'm unconscious of the other cars. I'm busy driving along the freeway thinking about philosophy, uh, and I suddenly realize, you know, I really ought to pay more attention to the traffic. But it isn't that I was totally unconscious of the, uh, the other cars on the freeway. If I was unconscious, there would have been a car crash. So uh, there, one of the fascinating things that I don't fully understand is attention. Uh, we do shift our attention at will. And there is quite a lot of interesting neurobiological research on attention. We're making progress with that because there are specific areas of the brain uh, that enable you to shift your attention from one thing to another. I am now just concerned with a case where I have visual awareness. I have a visual experience of objects and states of affairs, and I can shift my attention at will. The metaphor of the searchlight is almost inevitable. You know, I shine the searchlight of my attention on her, and then on to you, and then on to somebody else. Uh, and that is an intentional, uh, that in the ordinary sense of intending, that's something I intend to do. I intend to shift my attention from one object to another. But what I'm now struggling with is to try to characterize the presentational intentionality of visual experiences in a way that makes it clear how they're different from other forms of intentionality. It's not at all like beliefs and desires, because it's got all these features. It's directly connected to the condition of satisfaction and its experience as such, and its experience as caused by the condition of satisfaction. Okay, any other questions? Because now, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I had a question about um, objectivity and subjectivity yeah. and, um, and its relation to indexicality, so indexical thought. So you distinguish between um, ontological objectivity and yes. subjectivity, and you distinguish this from uh, epistemic objectivity and subjectivity. But now there is this uh, phenomenon of indexicality, indexical yeah. thought, and so on. And I mean, um, there are people like Nagel who seem to run these together, the uh, what you call ontological subjectivity, so phenomenal consciousness, or whatever you call it, with this, this phenomenon of indexical thought. So we all have this experience, thought, sorry, this perspective on the world, and it's somehow irreducible. And um, this seems to be in line with what you say. So my question would be, is there any intimate connection between this and your ontological subjectivity, or is it just a, another form of subjectivity, maybe semantic or intentional subjectivity, which you have? So you, do you have a third dimension of subjectivity? Yeah, I'm not quite sure what the question is, so let me make it clear what I'm saying. In your head, you have a conscious field. And I have just been focusing on certain elements of the conscious field, but it's important to see the conscious field is unified. I mean, this is one thing Kant understood very well and emphasized it. There's a, I, I hate this jargon, but there's a transcendental unity of apperception. So I don't just feel the shirt on my back and hear the sound of my voice, but I hear them as part of a single unified conscious field that extends through time. And I think this is one of the most amazing features of human consciousness 
is that it gives us this enormous, uh, enormously powerful access to the real world through our own ontological subjectivity. Now, the perceptual component of that is indexical, because it's always of the here and the now. And maybe indexical isn't a strong enough word. Maybe I should say didactic or uh, a, a, a somehow or other demonstrative, because it is directly connected to the conditions of satisfaction. And that's all part of the specific ontological subjectivity of perception. Perception gives you direct perceptual access to objects and states of affairs by way of subjective experiences that have those objects and states of affairs as conditions of satisfaction, and they are experienced as caused by the objects and states of affairs that you are perceiving. I'm not sure that answers your question, so say again if you want to say some more. I mean, maybe one question would be, so you, you, it seems to me that um, indexicality alone, or maybe yeah. practicalness, or whatever you call it, gives you a kind of subjectivity. I mean, this is not objective information, it's subject relative information. But it also seems to me that this um, ontological subjectivity is not necessary for this kind of um, subjectivity, because you can, you can have all kinds of um, indexicality without any... Um, phenomenal consciousness. Sure, you're going to have indexicality in language, which is not right. uh, conscious. But the, so, the peculiar form of uh, perceptual consciousness that I'm describing is that it's part of the awareness of the experience, that the experience gives you access to the here and the now. And you can't break that connection, even if you know that it's in fact broken. The star ceased to exist millions of years ago. All the same, you are seeing it as if it were here and now, even though you know what happened a long time ago. So, yes. so but would you call this a third kind of no, subjectivity? I, I mean, something like no. semantic um, subjectivity. Even if it's, you say it's entailed by, you seem to say it's entailed by this ontological sub subjectivity of phenomenal consciousness. See, you can have indexicality without any consciousness at all. Right. I mean, the, uh, the, the red and the green light tells you stop here or go from here, and there's no consciousness in the red and the green light. That's all observer relative. That's relative to us that we treat that as uh, communicating something to us in an indexical fashion. So indexicality isn't necessarily uh, tied to consciousness, but, per but perceptual consciousness carries indexicality as an intrinsic feature. That's the point I make. Oh, okay. <laughs> I got my own, yeah, I got my own. I'm, I'm confusing you with last night. Okay, uh, how, how much time am I using up here? What are we doing with the time? Yeah, we have time for one hour. Oh, we got another hour. Okay, well, that's fine. Well, that's, we, have, I mean, uh, we have plenty of time. Here's a guy with a question. Um, yeah, my question um, um, is concerned with uh, the fact that the subject, you kind of... Um, Can like, you talk into the mic again? Like, yeah, 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 <laughs> thanks for the advice though. Um, the subject is kind of sovereign in its perception. So, like a subject that it's not, um, that it is not um, um, pathological or hasn't yeah. any, you know, um, kind of... Um, irritation or whatever, he can, um, or this individual, uh, individual subject can decide for its own um, which perception is, is, is real or, yeah. or not. No, I don't think that's right. I think the subject is not sovereign. The point about perception is, it's not up to me. If I decide to look at this scene right here, it's not up to me what I see. I can say, well, I just assume not see that guy. I, and also look at him and not see him. I, it's not up to me. It's, I'm not sovereign. I'm sovereign when I have uh, fantasies. Oh, here I am flying through the air. Uh, but that's uh, I'm not, when I open my eyes and look around, I'm no longer flying through the air. So perception is interesting in that unlike intentional action, it's not up to me what I see. I can shift my attention or I can uh, close my eyes or move my head. But as long as I'm looking at this guy here, I'm going to see that guy, and it's, I don't get a choice. Right, but, yeah, yeah, I get the point, but, um, or I get the point, but what does it tell, um, what does it tell us about the intersubjectivity? The, the about subject, what? Like, intersubjectivity. Yeah. If you have a, like, 
two people in the desert, like standing yeah. far away from each other, and they s one sees a mirage, and yeah. they're you know communicating about a like yeah. a walkie-talkie, and the other one doesn't see the mirage. Yeah. So, and so they keep talking about it. Yeah. All okay. right. Yeah. They will keep talking about it. Right. Um, okay. Until now, somebody else shows up. Inner subjectivity is one of these notions that I've never been able to make uh, clear. Uh, and I think it just means collective intentionality. Uh, but I, I'm not, I, people have shown, I tried to help me know there's some, much more to it than just collective intentionality. Uh, the point is this, often your perceptions will be influenced by your reactions with, by your relation to other people. So you go to the art museum and you look at a painting and I say, it's absolutely dreadful. <laughs> And you say, no, it's got a lot of depth to it that you're not fully appreciating. You've never been able to appreciate Rothko, and that shows your aesthetic limitations. Because this big bulge of blue here expresses the power of blueness. Now, okay, then we may go on, and I may say, well, there's something to what you say. It does express the power of blueness, or it may look to me as dumb as any other Rothko I've ever seen. <laughs> This is uh, a matter of how we communicate, and often people do affect your... I mean, let me tell you, uh, uh, when I was a kid, I could not possibly have appreciated Italian opera. It seemed to me too idiotic for words. Uh, I mean, just think of the plot of, uh, I don't know, Traviata or Melorinov, <laughs> or La Boheme. Well, later on, when I get older and more sophisticated, then it seems to me fantastic, you see. And a lot of that had to do with my communication with other people. They pointed out to me uh, elements of the opera that I was missing as an intellectually snobbish young kid. Because in those days, I thought, why didn't all operas get written by Mozart? Because he knew how to do it. <laughs> but now I think, no, there's a lot of those 19th century Italians. But this is a result of education. And often you have to educate yourself to be less sophisticated than you were before. Yes, the music in uh, Traviata has a kind of simplicity, uh, which uh, is more, uh, more simple uh, than Don Giovanni, but all the same, it's very powerful. Uh, I once, uh, after seeing La Traviata, I was talking to a very rich woman, and she said, well, did you cry? And I said, Anne, I was sitting in a $200 seats. I cried every time I thought I, I, how much I paid for the tickets. <laughs> um, but in any case, okay, she have all these complex relations in perception. But I think art criticism is a good example because you learn to see things. You have to learn to see. And one of the things you have to learn to see is to see things in ways that you wouldn't see them without communicating with other people. If there were slides, I would show you um, a Van Gogh's a painting of a starry night. Now it doesn't look like a starry night because the stars are too damn big, right? But once you've seen it and really looked at it, the starry nights never look the same. I mean, so I think you have, uh, your perceptions are influenced by other people and influenced by the experiences you have. And we find it easy uh, to see Van Gogh uh, but uh, intelligent people in the 19th century would not have found it easy to see. They would have thought, well, he obviously didn't know how to paint. Uh, but now we have, we have a different conception. So I'm not sure that I'm directing, uh, directly answering your question, but I want to say, of course, your perceptions are influenced by your relations with other people, and this has to do often with the fact that your sensibility is shaped by the form of education you get. Yeah, um, if I, uh, one more point. Um, but what does that mean for like the continuous representation or like perception? You said it's um, like um, you know it's the now and here, but yeah. just now you said it's not the now and here, but it's more complex than it. Oh, it is. It is what I see now is of the here and now. And when I'm in the art museum uh, and we're looking at the actual painting, uh, then uh, the painting is something I, I see here and now. It's part of the. In, in, everybody understands indexicality. Index, indexicality just means it is reflexive to the actual experience itself. So the experience itself is connected to something that is here and now. And in the case of indexical words like this and that, 
Do you identify something relative to the utterance of the word? So yesterday always means the same thing, but it refers to different days on a different occasion of utterance, because it always refers to the day prior to the day of the utterance. And if you just think yesterday, it occurs to the day prior to the day of the thought. So all of these are token reflection. The token itself functions in fixing the conditions of satisfaction. Okay, I want to go on now with the question, well, how exactly does this thing here fix that as the conditions of satisfaction? And that is a non-trivial question. And I used to think that, well, there can't be any non-trivial answer to it, because it's internal to its being this very experience uh, that I'm seeing uh, an object in front of me. It couldn't be this, no, let's take red. It couldn't be this very experience if it wasn't an experience of seeming to see something red. So there's an internal connection between the subjective quality of the experience and the object and states of affairs that, you are, that it presents you with, because the experience necessarily fixes those conditions of satisfaction. So what is it about the experience that makes it an experience of red? And that's not a trivial question, even though there's a sense in which the answer has to be trivial, because it has to be internal to its being that very experience, that it's an experience of seeming to see something red. Does everybody get the question? See, when I wrote a book called Intentionality, I didn't think there could be any non-trivial answer to that question, because let's suppose this thing is red, and I'm having this experience here, uh, I, if I'm seeing it as red, there's no way I could see it as, uh, I, I, there's no way I could have that experience without seeming to see it as red, because that's built into the very structure of the experience. So it didn't seem to me there was any answer to this question, how is it possible that the, um, the uh, experience has conditions of satisfaction built into it? There wasn't any non-trivial answer to that, because the only answer could be, well, in order to be that very experience, it had to have those conditions of satisfaction. They're internal to the experience. And now it seems to me that's not a philosophically satisfactory answer. Why not? The experience is an event in the world like any other. And consequently, there must be some answer to the question, what fact about the experience makes it a case of seeming to see something red? There must be some answer to that question other than just saying, well, it's seeming to see something red. So I'm gonna, now going to try to answer that question. I'm going to give you two answers that are wrong to start with. One answer is to say, well, it's a case of seeming to see something red because it's red. Okay, I uh, have a red experience and that's why it presents a uh, red object because the experience is itself red. That won't do. Red is a color visible to everybody. And as I've told you over and over, this is not something that can be seen. Now, first rule of pedagogy, never write a falsehood on the blackboard because you'll see it back in the exams. Um, but so let's get rid of that. The experience is not itself right. Now the other answer, and both of these are famous answers in the history of philosophy. I mean, uh, 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 I remember that the Locke Descartes theory of perception was to say the experience themselves have these features that picture the features of the object. In the case of the primary qualities, they actually resemble features of the object. In the case of the secondary qualities, they don't. And I'm saying, you know, that's wrong in both cases. The experience itself isn't red, but it does present red as its condition of satisfaction, and we have to say, how does it do that? Another answer is to say, well, it's because it's caused by red things. Uh, and that's why uh, it presents red as its condition of satisfaction, uh, because it's always caused by red things. That won't do either, because there is a connection between the causal component and the intentional component, but it won't do to say just that it's caused. Suppose red always caused in me uh, something painful, it wouldn't follow uh, that the word red meant painful. No, but red is a color. So the question is, how does it get to name? How does this experience in virtue of its intrinsic structure, present the features of that object, given that the experience is ontologically subjective. 
and the object is ontologically objective, and the experience has this intrinsic structure, how does that structure present those conditions of satisfaction? That's now the question I want to address. Okay, it turns out it's a more complicated question than I realized. The first thing we have to do is make a distinction between different levels of the hierarchy of perception. Uh, if you have perceptions, there will be different levels of describing what it is that you see. So if you own a car, you can say, well, I see a car. And you can also say, I see my car. Uh, or I, you can identify the type of car it is or the color that it is. I see a 1996 Carrera 4, uh, uh, and it is black. I see a, a black 1996 Carrera 4. Okay, now what's going on in all of these experiences? That you're going to have these different levels of description of the same thing. And I want to, the first point I want to make is perception is hierarchical. You only see the higher level. You see that it's a Vermeer painting of a woman with an earring because you see certain colors and shapes on a canvas. So there's a hierarchy of perception where the, in order to perceive the higher level features, you have to perceive the lower level features. You perceive that it is this particular Vermeer, but in order to do that, you have to perceive certain colors and shapes. If you go through the steps in the hierarchy, you eventually reach rock bottom. And I want to say, perception only makes sense if you recognize both that there is a hierarchy of perceptual features and that the hierarchy has to bottom out in what I call basic features. And corresponding to basic features are the perceptual experiences of basic features, basic experiences. So if it's true that in order to see that it's your car, you've got to see all these other things, eventually reach rock bottom where you see colors and shapes. Now, the definition then of a basic feature is a feature that you can see, a basic visual feature, is a feature that you can see without seeing any other feature by way of which you see the basic feature. And a basic experience is an experience you can have without having some other experience by way of which you have that experience. So in order to see that, you're, it's, that it's your car, you have got to see the basic features of the car and in order uh, to see them eventually reach rock bottom, where you just have such things as colors and shapes and textures. That's the first point. All perception is hierarchical. And we're, we're struck by the fact that our perceptions are so uh, sophisticated that we see things at a very high level, so we don't just see uh, colors and shapes, that takes an enormous intellectual effort to just abstract the colors and shapes, but we see, for example, a whole lot of specific kind of cars on the freeway, or specific kind of trees and flowers, or specific sorts of architectural houses, or particular kind of structure of the houses. In every case, our background abilities enable us to perceive things at the higher level, where we identify it in terms of our skills, in terms of the skills that we bring to bear upon the identification. But in order to see those higher level features, we have to see the lower level features until we reach rock bottom of basic features. Now, I'm embarrassed to define basic feature because typically you can't see color without seeing a shape, and you can't see shape without seeing a color. So which is more basic, the shape or the color? Well, I think my intuitive idea is clear enough. The idea is that there's something you see without seeing anything else by way of what you see. You can't see a car without seeing colors and shapes, but you can see colors and shapes without seeing a car. So they are more basic uh, than uh, uh, the car. And maybe the right thing is to say, well, color and shapes really is the basic feature. OK, so let's narrow our question down slightly. What is it about the raw perceptual experience that presents the basic features? So we're not talking about uh, a Mozart symphonies here. That's a higher level feature. And you do perceive uh, this as a, a particular Mozart symphony. Uh, we're not talking about a, a particular make and model, a particular model of the Carrera 4. That's much a higher level than we're talking about. We're just talking about how do you see the basic features 
such thing as seeing red. And I said it won't do to say it's by way of resemblance, and it won't do to say it's by way of causation. What fact about the experience makes it necessarily an experience of seeming to see something red? And I want to say the fact is something like this. It's part of what it means for something to be red that it's capable of, capable of causing experiences like this. It's not all that it means, but it's of the essence of something's being red that it's capable of causing this type of experience. Suppose I have an experience, and just give it a name, call it Glock, so we're not going to avoid the bad argument. You can't see Glock, but you have an experience, you call it Glock. Now, what would make that an experience of red if it were, is, if, if it were part of the essence of something to be red, that it was capable of causing experiences like Glock? It was capable, capable of causing Glock experiences. And I think this is generally true of the basic features of lines, and uh, colors and angles and shapes that they are uh, simple shapes at least uh, that it's part of what it is for something to be red that is capable of causing experiences like this now we're it's harder to see that for the so-called primary qualities because we have standard uh, geometrical definitions of what it is to be a straight line all the same there can't be a random connection between this kind of experience and something being a straight line. Otherwise, we couldn't use the vocabulary. Otherwise, we couldn't train our dogs uh, to recognize straight lines from other types of lines. It's true, when we get sophisticated and develop a geometry, then we will give definitions of straight lines uh, which are not, which make no reference to our perceptual apparatus. But the first claim I want to make is that the most bottom level, uh, the basic perceptual experiences are presentations of the basic perceptual features because the basic perceptual features are in part co constituted by their ability to cause these sorts of perceptual experiences. So you don't get either the mistake of saying, well, it looks like red because it is red, and you don't get the mistake of saying it looks like red uh, because it's caused by red. You have to combine those two to say, Part of what it is for something to be red is for it to cause experiences like this. And that's, I want to say, is true generally of the basic features. Okay, but now that has several interesting consequences, not all of which are intuitively obvious. One is, it turns out uh, that depth is not a basic feature. Uh, we can't say well, the visual field is two-dimensional, because that's the bad argument. You don't see the visual field. But it's important to be able to see that leaving out stereopsis for a moment, any experience you can produce in the visual field with a three-dimensional scene, you can produce with a two-dimensional scene. All the same, when I actually look at this group of people, it doesn't look like the ones at the back are a lot smaller than the ones at the front, because we have what is called size constancy. Now, here's the next set of questions, then. How do you get from the basic perceptual features, which do not have size constancy? I mean, these people occupy a smaller, uh, the people at the back of the office occupy a smaller portion of my perceptual field than the people at the front. But all the same, there's an important sense in which they all look roughly the same size. They're all, so to speak, middle-sized Germans. There aren't any giants or any pygmies. Or, uh, they're just uh, ordinary-sized people, whole room full. Now, uh, how is that possible? How do you get color constancy and size constancy given, given the basic features? Now, we're in kind of philosophical deep water here, so let me just say where we are. We're trying to describe what it is about the raw perceptual experience that sets conditions of satisfaction. Granted that, you can't see the raw perceptual experience. You, it's not itself an object of perception. Rather, it is itself the seeing. But there must be an answer to the question, what fact about it makes it have those conditions of satisfaction? And the condition of adequacy of answering that question is it can't be circular. You can't say, well, it has those conditions of satisfaction because it's a case of seeing something red or seeing something that looks red. That's what we're trying to explain is what it is for it to look red. And I'm saying where the basic features are concerned, it is part 
of the essence of something being that basic feature that is capable of causing those sorts of perceptual experiences. But now then, uh, we've got to now get to the more complex features. What about complex things? You, you don't just see colors and shapes. You see a particular type of tree or a particular type of car. Uh, and you don't just see uh, colors and shapes, but you see that the people, these people are in the front of the room, and those people are in the back of the room. And I now have to answer that question. But let's go on to that. But first, let's stop for questions, because this is the... Uh, the, uh, the least worked out part of the stuff that I'm telling you, and I need your uh, comments on it. Yeah. What you have been like presenting in the last part of this talk made me thought, maybe made me think about the Ebbinghaus or the Tischner illusion, in which you see some circles. And if they are surrounded, like for example, by smaller circles, they look as if the circle in the, in the middle is bigger. Yeah. And in the other way, I mean, if it's surrounded by equal circles, so it looks the same. So in this case, it, it looks as we have like a perceptual illusion, but like what like Milner and Goodale and other people have realized is that the illusion is not, is not the same if you ask the subject to act. So the, the action of the subject, he adapt his grip so that so that the grip is not like per, pervade the right. illusion. So it seems that in this case I would ask you like which are the conditions that set the perception, the scene, yeah. so that the subject can report something yeah. as being an illusion and act in a different way. Okay. So it seems that the conditions here vara are different. Yeah. And, or at least there's something where, I mean, it's, it's just like a question about how do you, do you interpret this illusion? And yeah. Well, the most spectacular cases of these are where you can systematically um, introduce illusions. And the most spectacular case I know is the Ames room, uh, where you come into the room and it looks like an ordinary room, but there's a man who appears in the door and he, he's so huge. He has to lean over to get in because his shoulders are banging against the ceiling. Or if you go and stand over there and somebody comes in this uh, door, it looks like they're tiny pygmies. They barely come up to the door handle. Now, the, the notion that I haven't yet introduced, but I better introduce it now, is the notion of your background capacities. You have a set of background abilities that enable you to interpret the raw data of your perception. And what we do with these illusions is we trick you. We trick you by appealing to your background capacities um, uh, in such a way that the normal set of expectations that those background capacities give you are violated. Now, I've used a dangerous word here. I said interpretation, and that's misleading, because I, think, I think we normally don't interpret our experiences. We just have them. The way the Ames room works is this. The room looks like an ordinary room, but in fact, this is the shape of the room. So if you see somebody coming in here, they look gigantic. They have to bend over to get in. They're banging up against uh, the, uh, the, the ceiling. And if they come in here, the same person, they look like pygmies because they're so small relative to the rest of the room. Now what happens is the visual system is, is trained with cues. We have certain cues. And uh, the cue for people in our civilization is, roughly speaking, rooms are rectangular. Uh, and uh, one wall is approximately the same size as the other wall. You get differences with auditoriums, but this is, looks like an ordinary room. In fact, it's radically different. Now, that's a case where the background capacities that you bring to bear trick you. you you assume that this is a standard room and that these are standard sized people. Now, it's interesting if you actually, if it's somebody familiar, I mean, if, you're, if it's your spouse who comes in here, it doesn't look like she's become a giant. It looks like you're in a very funny room. Uh, so it only works with strangers. It works with just ordinary people coming in, and then they look gigantic. But in a way, I think that's, and that, that's all consistent with what I'm saying. What I'm saying is what you perceive without any, I don't, I, I don't know how to put this precisely. I want to say not without any interpretation. But what you see at the, perceive at the ground level are the basic perceptual features. 
And then you have these perceptual capacities that enable you to structure them with certain conditions of satisfaction. So right now, the portion of my visual field occupied by the people at the back of the room is smaller than the portion of my visual field occupied by the people at the front of the room. And what I actually have at the basic level is, so to speak, a two-dimensional representation. But my background capacities enable me to see all the people as the same size, what's called size constancy, even though I, the basic perceptual features are not size constancy. Let me put this in its most strong form. At the basic level, there's no such thing as color constancy or size constancy. Size constancy and color constancy are arrived at by higher level perceptual capacities, what I call background abilities, uh, that enable you to structure the intentionality so that it gives you a better take on reality, even though it doesn't match the basic features. I mean, and the standard example is the railroad track illusion, where uh, the converging lines toward the top give the impression of being further away. It looks like those are further away, and there's a standard illusion, the Ponzo illusion, uh, where it looks like, even though these are the same size, it looks like that line is bigger uh, than this line here because you have uh, two uh, sets of conflicting principles. One is the principle that says you get con uh, convergence uh, away uh, from you. Uh, the lines converging the, are seen as further away in the direction of the convergence, and lines that occupy the same area of the visual field will be seen as larger or smaller depending on whether or not they're seen as further away or less further away. This is standard case of the Ponzo illusion. And in the Ponzo illusion, the, the standard textbook account says, well, you have these two uh, different principles operating, uh, and they give you this illusion. Now, I, I'm not endorsing that account, but I am saying, in fact, you do see uh, this line as larger than that line. And you do that because you have background abilities to respond to perceptual cues. And I have background abilities, where background for me means a set of unconscious capacities that you have. I have background abilities that enable me to see the people at the back of the room as having the same size as the, as the people in the front of the room, even though the basic perceptual features are different. The basic perceptual features are that these people are bigger than those people, but that's canceled out by my background abilities. So you have a hierarchical structure of perception and the first thesis that I have advanced is that there is, so to speak, a conceptual, I don't want to use that word because it sounds too linguistic, but there is a kind of essential connection between the basic features and their capacity to cause in you certain types of perceptual experiences. But now we have to explain, well, how do you get then from the basic features to the higher level features, and how do you get such things as uh, a perception of depth? And the answer I've given about perception of depth is you have background abilities that enable you to use cues of the basic features to make perceptions. I don't say judgment, but to make perceptions which violate the perceptions of the basic features. So the basic features are people at the front are bigger than the people at the back, but the perception I actually have is they're all roughly speaking the same size. You get a higher level feature of color constancy and size constancy, even though the basic perceptual features do not have color constancy and size constancy. How's that for an outrageous view? Mm -hmm. um, okay, but now it gets worse, so let me give you, I, I, let me go on to the next question, which is, well, how do you get that, how do you perceive um, a species of tree? Now, California is great for simple-minded people like me, because there are very few species of trees. I can teach you all the kinds of California trees in a, in a few minutes, whereas you can't do that in Europe or in Vermont. they got lots of trees, but we have very few. One kind we got lots of are California redwood trees. Now, how is it that I can see that thing as a California redwood tree? And there's no question uh, that it is part of my perceptual content that it is a California redwood tree. Uh, now, the answer to that is, well, actually, the particular combination of features that make for the appearance of a California redwood tree is rather simple to describe. It's certain shades of green, certain textures, certain kinds of bark, certain size, uh, and uh, a certain sorts of shape of the trunk. And so you get a, something that's sort of the dream of the psychological atomist 
simply by combining the basic features, the basic perceptual features, you can get the perception of a California redwood tree. You get, you, I, you see it as a combination of these features. Yes, that is exactly the right texture of the frond, and that is exactly the right color of the frond, and that is something you see as a California redwood tree. All right, now why is that important to us? Well, perception is hierarchically structured. How high does it go? You see, I can literally see that it's a California redwood tree, but can I literally see that she's intelligent? She looks intelligent. Can I literally see that she's intelligent? Or he looks drunk. Can I literally see that he's drunk? I don't think so. Uh, you have a, an upper limit on the basic perceptual features. I think, I, 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 sorry, you have an upper limit on the hierarchy of the perceptual features. It begins with the basic features and the ba corresponding to the basic perceptual experience, and it goes up until the top level. What's the top level? What is the highest level of what you can actually see? And the answer I want to propose to that is this. <laughs> Perception bottoms out in the basic perceptual features, and these are things like uh, color, texture, line, and angle. Uh, but it does not include depth. Depth is not a basic perceptual feature. You have to have a background ability to perceive depth, and the argument for that that I gave you is you can reproduce uh, the, the subjective visual field with a two-dimensional stimulus. All right, but now if it bottoms out in those features which you can see without seeing anything else by way of which you see them, then what's the top? What is the top level? What's the highest level you can see? You can literally see, I'm sorry, I'm gonna turn, turn this damn thing off. Okay, all right, how about that? Um, the, uh, what you can literally see is the higher level features, but there must be a top level of what you can see. As I said, you can't literally see that the guy is drunk, and that's a good thing when you're driving, because they've got to have more than just how you look. Uh, they have to have some chemical test. Now, I want to say the intuitive idea is this. The top level of vision is marked by an epistemic condition, namely how you would settle what it is in fact. So if I say that's a California redwood tree, and you say, no, it's not a California redwood tree, uh, it's a Monterey pine, uh, we can settle that by the further visual investigation. Now by settle, I don't mean scientifically settle. Of course, to do that, you'd have to settle it with a DNA. But for practical purposes, you can identify something as a California redwood tree by its perceptual experience, and you can distinguish it from a Monterey pine again by its perceptual experience. So the, the claim I'm making is that the bottom level of the hierarchy is set by the basic perceptual features, those you can perceive without seeing, without perceiving anything else by way of which you perceive them. And the top level is settled by what you would settle epistemically as uh, what can be settled by the visual or other sorts of perceptual inspection. Now, it might look like that's inconsistent. Why do you have an epistemic criterion for one and not the other? But I think they're basically the same. Uh, that is, what we get from perception is direct access to the world. And this is why uh, the correct answer to skepticism uh, is to reject uh, those pictures I showed you earlier, where you never see the real world, you just see. Uh, representations of the world. No, what you actually get from reality uh, when you perceive it is direct knowledge. You don't, when I, I, when I look at this table, I don't have evidence that there's a table there. I can see it. In this case, seeing that there's a table there is knowing that there's a table there. Uh, the direct perception gives me direct knowledge. So the basic, the fact that the basic features are identified relative to our perceptual capacities and the higher level features are identified relative to our epistemology does not seem to be inconsistent. It seems to me they're both the same. Now it does have this feature and that is there's a kind of gray area. What is it that we can settle by visual experience and what can we not settle? But I think that's probably right. I think that is part of our concept of uh, perception. There's some things that we would settle 
uh, perceptually and other things that might not be clear that we would settle in perceptually. As we get more scientifically sophisticated, we think, well, it doesn't really matter what it looks like. It's what the DNA is. But I think it's important if you train your dog to recognize California redwood trees from Monterey Pines, because you want him to behave toward one in a different way than the other, you do it on the basis of his perceptual apparatus. Okay, I've made a number of strong claims. Let me just repeat them, and then we'll stop for discussion about this point. One, I've claimed uh, that there is a hierarchy of perception, and the bottom level, the crucial level, uh, the intentionality is fixed by the fact that it's of the essence of having the basic perceptual features that they are capable of causing certain sorts of experiences. That these go up then into a higher level, and that the higher level, in at least in some cases, can be seen a combination of elements of the lower level. Now, a lot of cases cannot be seen like that. To see uh, that the car is a 1937 Chevrolet, uh, you've got to have a whole lot of causal and historical information. Uh, my dog has wonderful vision, but he cannot uh, identify 1937 Chevrolets in a way that uh, experts can. So you, I, I haven't gone through all of them, but I have said at least for some interesting combinations, where you have, for example, species of trees, you can do that on the basis of combinations of the basic features. However, there are several counterintuitive results. One is you never see depth. Depth is a, uh, as a basic feature. Uh, depth is, a, uh, uh, is an experience uh, that is derived from your background abilities, your background capacities in coping with the basic perceptual features. Size constancy and color constancy are not basic elements. They're much higher level phenomena. Uh, and that the, the, the whole structure, the whole hierarchy of perception has a bottom level with the basic features and a top level with those phenomena that can be settled for practical purposes by perceptual experience. Okay, so let's take questions about that. I'm going back to the beginning of your lessons. Uh, you started by saying us that there is a big mistake, a very bad thing which happened to philosophy, and it was to, to take apart the reality and the mind. Yeah. Um, and now you're, uh, you recognize yourself that you're trying to um, understand the causal relationship yeah. between uh, the exterior, external reality and the mind. So, um, uh, I'm asking uh, a little bit naive, uh, if, um, what is the difference um, of the problem Descartes, Descartes was uh, dealing with and the problem you are dealing with? It looks to me that the five criteria you, give, you gave us still doesn't allow us to uh, make a difference between hallucination and yeah. uh, perception, and also that uh, this... Um, interesting uh, analysis you just made. I, I, I don't know, I, I don't see in, in which um, relationship it uh, helps uh, solving the problem of uh, causal... Of solving the problem of what? So solving the problem of causal uh, yeah. relationship between a reality yeah. and the mind. Okay, well let me answer the question and then you tell me if the answer satisfies you. Uh, the point is, Descartes could not have accepted this picture because on this picture you directly perceive objects and states of affairs in the world. On Descartes' picture, all you can ever perceive are ideas in the mind. How then do you know there are objects and states of affairs in the world? And remember, Descartes has one of the, the most implausible proofs in the higher, entire history of philosophy. And it goes, the way you know that there's a piece of chalk in front of you, even though you can't see it, is that your perception gives you every reason to suppose there's a piece of chalk there, and hence God gives you every reason to suppose there's a piece of chalk there, but if there weren't a piece of chalk, God would be a deceiver, and that's impossible. God can't be a deceiver, so there's a piece of chalk there. I'm embarrassed to repeat this in front of an adult audience, but that was Descartes' proof that we can have perception of the external world. Uh, and then he's got a problem, well, how is it I can ever be mistaken? And his answer, if you remember, is, well, the will is infinite, and the, and the uh, cognition, the cognitive capacity is finite, uh, 
or understand in his terminology is will and understand. The will is infinite, understanding is finite, and we make judgments that go beyond what we clearly and distinctly perceive. But if I clearly and distinctly perceive that there's a piece of chalk there, then there must be a piece of chalk there, otherwise God would be a deceiver. I hope that doesn't sound like me, because that's not my view. My view is that we have direct perceptual contact uh, with the real world, and we uh, our, our task in this part of the philosophy of, of philosophy of perception is to try to explain what are the features of the raw perceptual experience that present objects and states of affairs in the world, and how do they do that? And they must be, the answer in a some sense must be trivial, because it's internal to its being this experience that it is an experience of something white, and yet there must be, I must be able to characterize that experience in a way that doesn't say it's an experience of something white, because I want to be able to explain what makes it an experience of something white. And the answer I give it is, it's an experience of something white, because for something to be white is for it to be capable of causing experiences like this. That's the key part of the answer. Then the question is, how far can you go with that? I say that's true up to a point with the basic perceptual features, but then the other perceptual features you have to get by combinations of basic features, and then, when it gets more difficult, by collateral information. I can look and say, that's a Vermeer. I can tell that's a Vermeer. And often you can do this without knowing exactly how you can tell it's a Vermeer. But you can tell. It's a, well, Vermeer's kind of easy because he only painted, what, 35 paintings. You can memorize them all. But, but Van Gogh painted 800, okay? I mean, you can download, I've downloaded all 800, but, I, but I'm much, much of many of them are trash. But still, I can look at a picture and tell you that that's a Van Gogh, even though it's not one I recognize as one of the 800. Now, uh, how do I do that? Well, I do it on the basis of combinations of the basic perceptual feature together with a whole lot of historical knowledge. And that I haven't got to yet. Now we're just talking about uh, how you get things like it's a California redwood tree, but not, you can literally see that it's a Van Gogh. And, but now the question is how high can you go? Can you literally see that it's expensive? No, I don't think you can. You need other, more information uh, than that uh, to see that it's expensive. So the argument I gave was bottom level settled by basic perceptual features. Those you can see without seeing anything else by way of which you see them. Top level set by how you would find out for practical purposes. And I like that because it's vague. I mean, it leaves a whole lot of things open. Consider wine tasting. I used to work for a small winery. And the point about wine tasting is it is a very tough discipline. You know, you think uh, as undergraduates in Oxford, we would drink a lot of wine and make a lot of pretentious remarks. Tastes flinty to me, we would say things like that. But when you get to be a serious wine taster, you've got to slosh it around in your mouth and say, too much acetic acid. <laughs> or you do a lot of sniffing. How long did you leave it in the oak? Too oaky. Uh, so you learn all this, so you got to learn to sniff and spit. Uh, and in the old days, we used to say you could tell a good wine man, and this was a sexist era, because I mean, now you'd say a good wine person by how he or she sniffs and spits. Uh, because, well, you, uh, it's a bit sorry to describe it, but you have these buckets that you spit into, because if you swallow the wine all day long, you're no good by late afternoon. So you got to spit it out. And what you do is, you spit it out in such a way as to get it as much as you can through the whole olfactory tract. So all of the smell and flavor of the wine is into your perceptual system. And then you say very interesting things about the basic perceptual features. Now, the problem with the atomists is they thought it was all just a combination of the basic perceptual features, but it isn't. Of course, the way they teach you to be a wine man is first you taste each of the elements separately. You taste the taste of grape sugar, the taste of acetic acid, the taste of tannin, the taste of, the, of something that's been soaked in the oak, and they all taste awful. <laughs> I mean, as individually, imagine having a good taste of acetic acid on your tongue, or tannin. It's just awful. But when you put it all together, if you get what we call balance, it tastes pretty good. And the balance is not just a summation 
of the features, but all the same, you should be able to identify the separate features if you're ever going to be able to do this. Now, this is a good example because uh, all, uh, the combination of uh, gustatory and olfactory sensation is very imprecise in us, uh, and, uh, as opposed to visual perception, which is pretty good. Now, my dog has pretty good sense of smell because he's got a much bigger portion of his brain devoted to smell than I have of my brain, and he can make all kinds of discriminations that I cannot make, and I cannot imagine what that's like. Imagining, well, I don't want to go through it, but it's clear that he identifies members of the opposite sex or his own sex by sniffing. I, and I, what, what must be like to have that uh, particular means of identification? Uh, okay, I don't know how we got off onto this, but let me go back to the <laughs> uh, What we're trying to explain is how you get from the lower level to the higher level, and I'm saying it's partly combinatory. I can identify California redwood trees by combinatorial methods. But when you get to higher level things, like identifying a Van Gogh painting or a Bach triple fugue, uh, then it's not just combinatory. All kinds of other information has to come in. Yeah. I think you just answered my question. because You hesitated at a certain point when you were saying the words conceptual or judgmental. Yeah. I assume that this is where you're going now. With yeah. I mean, is, your example before of an art appreciation or music appreciation, yeah. of course, or now with wine tasting, it seemed as though before you were sort of folding that into the perception, but now it seems as though you're not doing that, that there's an intellectual or conceptual element there. Yeah. Well, the point is there's an awful lot of information necessary beyond the perceptual input in order for you to identify something as a 1970 Chateau Lafitte. You've got to have an awful lot of collateral information. Now, that collateral information gets into the perceptual experience in a way that I think would have to be analyzed neurobiologically. I don't think there's a philosophical analysis of that. What the philosophy can give us is a characterization of the <coughs> raw perceptual experience, which will explain why it has the conditions of satisfaction that it does, uh, and how it must necessarily have those conditions of satisfaction. It couldn't be that perceptual experience if it didn't have those conditions of satisfaction. Now, philosophers will say, yeah, but you've left out spectrum inversion. Uh, what about that? Uh, so let me say a brief word about that. Now, philosophers have these favorite uh, examples. And incidentally, let me mention a couple things here. We talk about hallucinations as if it's the most common thing in the world. In fact, it's very rare. As far as I know, I've never had hallucination. Uh, but it's a good example because in hallucination this thing is the same but that thing isn't out there at all. And hallucinations tend to be either pathological or in California recreational. Uh, uh, you can, I, have, I don't do this and I would never do it but I have known uh, people, even students, who ingested various chemical substances into themselves because of their capacity uh, to disorder the senses, to give them uh, types of experiences which were not entirely veridical. So uh, you do have uh, these uh, experiences, but I've never had uh, these hallucinatory experiences. But now then the question arises, well suppose there was a section of the population that had an experience that they call seeing red, which if I could have that experience, I would call it seeing green. And they have an experience they call seeing green, which I could have that experience I would call seeing red. Are you familiar with this? Is everybody familiar with this? It's called red-green inversion or spectrum inversion. Now, the important thing to see here is that uh, there's no behavioral test because their behavior is exactly the same. They all stop when the light, everybody stops when the light turns red and goes when it turns green. It's just that they have completely different experiences. Okay, now how is my conception of perceptual experience supposed to cope with that, if red consists in the ability to cause these experiences? Uh, well, I think it's very important uh, that the uh, spectrum inversion doesn't exist. We don't have it. Uh, you can imagine a guy who could move from one section of the population to another just by putting a, pulling a switch on his skull. And he'd have to remember whether he was in the red stage or the green stage, otherwise he wouldn't stop, he'd be in car crashes because he wouldn't stop when the light was red. 
uh, but all the same, uh, he would have to coordinate his behavior appropriately. How do I know that we're not in the red-green stage? And the answer, I think, is obvious, because I know that there's a commonality of the perceptual neurobiology. When I first got interested in the brain, I started reading these brain books, and I read a book in which the author said, cats perceive colors differently from the way we perceive colors. And as a philosopher, I thought, well, how the hell do you know? Have you ever been a cat? <laughs> Have you ever, uh, do you know what it's like to be a cat? And the answer is, of course they know, because they can check the machinery. They check the actual color receptors. And the color receptors in the cat are just different. I forget exactly how they're different, but they're different from human beings. How come we know so much about cats? The answer is they're cheap. Uh, it's unfortunate that for the cats uh, that they are cheap. Uh, macaques are much more expensive. And Francis Crick once told me that it was a scandal that we knew more about the neuroanatomy of the macaque monkey than we did about human beings. Uh, but, but again, they're cheaper than uh, human beings, and it's less immoral uh, to work on macaque monkeys. I'm not sure it is, actually, but I haven't gone into the morality of this research. But in any case, we know an awful lot about cats' visual experience. Now, you might think, well, what difference does it make if their behavior is exactly the same? Then what difference does it make whether or not they have red, green inversions? And I wish I had the screen, the slide here, because I had one of my students take Monet's famous painting of the field of poppies and do a red-green inversion. So all the poppies come out green, and the rest of the field comes out red. It utterly ruins the picture. I, it, you can't say, well, it really doesn't make any difference about red-green. The red-green inversion would be exactly the same, uh, whether or not I, uh, that they uh, had the same inner experience as we do, as long as they made the same discriminations. No, I think it matters enormously. Uh, it, the uh, aesthetics, uh, and I don't mean that in any trivial sense, I mean the basic perceptual experience of the picture is totally different uh, if you have a red-green inversion. And if I ever publish this the stuff we're talking about now, I'll give you those two images. The image as Monet painted it, and the image where it is done with a red-green inversion. Okay, well, how much time do we have left? I mean, maybe um, another few minutes? Ten minutes, yes. Okay, well, all right, let me, I, I really won't try to develop uh, a, a more new information, but let me just repeat some of the things and then uh, throw them open for discussion. I have been assuming a general conception of perception, where perception gives you a direct presentation of objects and states of affairs in the world, and that's why it's different from other kinds of intentionality. It's not like beliefs and desires. You can shuffle your beliefs and desires as much as you want, but with perception, you're directly up against the real world. Even if you know it's a hallucination, you still experience it as if you were having it directly against the real world. Okay, that means there's a causal component in perception, and I want to insist that causal component is part of the experience. In the case of perception, you experience the world causing you to have these experiences, whereas in the way of in, in the, uh, in intentional action, you experience yourself causing these changes to the world. But that raises an interesting, uh, a set of interesting questions. Well, what are the relationships between the subjective visual and other perceptual field in the head and objects and states of affairs in the world. Now, when I wrote the book Intentionality, I didn't think there could be an answer to that question that wasn't trivial. There's no way I could have this experience without it seeming to me uh, that I'm seeing a piece of chalk. Well, why isn't that the right answer? That what I thought in 1983. That is, uh, the only answer is disquotational. That is, just as snow is white is true, is if and only if snow is white, well, this experience is such that it is satisfied only if it's an experience of seeing something white, and that's because it's an experience of seeming to see something white. You just get there, you just repeat yourself. Why is that an adequate answer? For a long time, literally years, I thought it was an adequate answer, but in the end, I think it isn't. Why? Because the experience, this thing going on in your head, is an event in the world like any other. And there must be an answer to the question, what features of that experience 
enable it to present the objects and states of affairs it does. And the answer I'm proposing is, begins by saying, you must first identify the hierarchy of perceptual experience. It's hierarchical, in the same way actions are hierarchical. In order uh, to fire the gun, you have to pull the trigger. You have a hierarchy uh, in action and a hierarchy in perception. The hierarchy in perception bottoms out in basic perceptual features and correspondingly basic perceptual experiences. Now the essential claim I'm making is that for the basic perceptual experiences, in order to be that basic perceptual feature, it has to be capable of causing the basic perceptual experiences. I'm reluctant to say it's necessary and sufficient. It isn't, because we know too much. We know too much about physiology and geometry and so on. But if you think of it from an animal point of view, uh, for something to be a straight line, is for it to, to look like that. And then, but you can't say look like that, because the look straight, uh, it can only be explained in terms of is straight. So in order to explain look straight, you have to say it's capable of causing the kind of experiences that this uh, stimulus causes. So the answer for the basic perceptual experiences is that the basic perceptual features have as their, and I don't want to say by definition, as that's too linguistic. My dog doesn't know any definitions. But it has as their essential character that they're capable of causing certain sorts of experiences, and that's why they necessarily present those objects as their condition of satisfaction, because the experience comes to you as both qualitative and caused, and causal. And the point is that the quality you perceive is defined, I I, again, I almost want to say defined, but that's because we've had this philosophical training. I want to say it's, it's essential to its being that perceptual feature, that basic perceptual feature, that is caught capable of causing this perceptual experience. But that leaves me with a whole lot of questions. Well, what about the perception of depth, which is not a basic perceptual feature? And there I want to say, and, that's, and this is common in uh, standard theories of perception, uh, that uh, depth is not a basic perceptual feature. It's a background capacity, presumably an A. I mean, we wouldn't survive without it. But you have the basic perceptual features which don't have color constancy and size constancy, and then you're able to perceive things with color constancy and size constancy because you have these background abilities. Again, the history of painting is very important to us here. If you look at early medieval paintings, they're very simple-minded. They give you two-dimensional uh, representations of objects. But when you get to the Renaissance, you get incredible sophistication because these guys understood the principles of perspective. So they can give you a two-dimensional object which will cause in you an experience which is like seeing a three-dimensional object. And that is because they understood how the, comp the arrangement of the basic perceptual features will pr produce an experience of three-dimensionality even though you've got a two-dimensional stimulus. Okay, well, maybe we may take more questions about that, because that's a summary, really, of the, of the points I was trying to make. Yeah? I wanted to ask you more about the vis visual experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but uh, I wonder whether you didn't hypothesize the yeah. visual experience. Although you say, well, it's, it's not visible, it doesn't represent, it presents. Yeah. But at the same time, um, uh, I want to explain the correspondence between the visual experience and what is seen. Yes, and, and I wonder the whether, same vocabulary to describe both. Yeah, and I wonder whether it's uh, there. It's not more simple, more naive than that. What the visual experience is not inside the head. Yeah. You could say that what is inside the head is my neurons firing in a certain yeah. way, and I experience the object that mm -hmm. is in front of me. So I can, mm -hmm. if I want to localize that, I could say it's not there, or I could go with Aristotle yeah. and say that the act is in what receives the act, yeah. and say, well, it's only inside the head, and then I in this Descartes' problems. Yeah, but that's so, if you make the bad argument. Not, if you avoid think, the bad argument, I think I avoided the bad argument because, uh, see, you, you, you told us that the um, experience contains this uh, causal element. Yeah. 
But what happens when I see something, a flash of light? I'm not saying something caused me uh, to have uh, um, to, to see some light. I say, I say there was a light there. Yeah. And so now so why is say the that? experience... Uh, why do we need to differentiate at all between yeah. the experience and what is and what you experience? Up. Okay, let me give you two answers to that. Uh, one is, what happens when I close my eyes? All of the objects remain the same. Something stopped. Well, I stopped seeing the objects. Yes, and what stopped when I stopped seeing the objects? The visual experience stopped. That's the first argument. The second argument is, what happens after the photons hit the retina? And I'll tell you what, well, I won't tell you the whole damn story, because it's a long story involving the lateral geniculate nucleus and the feedback mechanisms and so on. But I will tell you, it terminates in a conscious visual experience. The third argument is, what's the difference? between seeing something and having this uh, non-experiential knowledge like you get in blindsight. In, in, every case, in every case of normal perception, you have a conscious visual experience and an object or state of affairs in the world. And what puzzles us, and what I'm trying to answer the puzzle is, the description is the same. Uh, uh, the same. That, uh, what did I see? A white piece of chalk. What was the experience? It was the experience of seeing a white piece of chalk. Same words in the same order. All the same, this is ontologically subjective, goes on in the head, and it stops when I close my eyes. This is ontologically objective, and it's out there in the world. Indeed, it's a little bit misleading to say uh, that the, the description is the same, because these are temporary and fleeting. The visual experiences go on for uh, a, a few moments, and then they stop and change as you move your head. But the objects and states of affairs, they uh, persist for years. I mean, they go on and on. They have a kind of permanence. There is a class of people who want to deny the existence of visual experience, but I don't know how they'd ever get an account of uh, the neurobiology of perception. What are these brain stabbers doing? What they're doing is trying to figure out how the perceptual stimulus of the retina causes such things as color experiences. And those are experiences that go on in your head. Uh, I have a question about um, basic um, features, yeah. and um, I get the impression that the basic features are in the object, features of yeah. an object. They are features so, of an object. Therefore, yeah. in your language, um, they are uh, object. Um, they are um, ontological objective. Yes. But you said um, if something is ontological objective, that therefore it has to um, be. Um, it's um, yeah. Um, it's no matter if we see it, if we perceive it or yeah, not. That's right. But you um, declared that um, the features are described by being capable of causing the perception of the feature. Yes. So you you um, de um, you describe them just we are our perception. Yes. So if there were no humans or no uh, beings yeah. who could per perceive, yeah. there would be no reality in um, no, that being involve. capable of uh, being perceived. Yeah. That's not the theory. Let me state it. I probably didn't state it as precisely as I should, so let me state it again. I now see a small white piece of chalk. What's going on? In the world independent of me, there is an object of a certain color and a certain shape. That is ontologically objective. What makes those features basic features is that I can see those features without seeing anything else by way of which I see those features. Whereas, in order to see this as my watch, I've got to see other features by way of which I see those features. Okay, but now what makes them? What is special about the basic features? How does this uh, uh, perceptual experience present those features? And the answer is, Corresponding to the basic perceptual features are basic perceptual experiences. Now, the reason that those basic perceptual experiences present uh, the uh, basic perceptual features is part of what it is to be a basic perceptual feature is for it to be capable of causing that sort of experience. But it remains that way even if nobody's ever looking at it. Even if no one had ever looked at it, it would still have that capacity. So we're going to describe this as a as a rectangular shaped uh, white object. See, rectangular is already 
uh, non-basic, but at least as having lines uh, and a surface and color, then we are describing something in terms of the capacity to produce this sort of perceptual experience. But there's no idealism. I'm not saying, oh, well, then if there were no people, there'd be no objects. No, that's not true. But basic perceptual features and basic uh, uh, perceptual experiences are defined relative to us. You can imagine people have different perceptual apparatus altogether for which something else would be basic. Maybe they can perceive molecular structure uh, as a basic perceptual feature. We cannot. Uh, we, we're sort of middle-sized objects are what we're good at. Uh, and we can't see basic perceptual features a line stretching a thousand miles. It's, it's too much for us. So the basic perceptual features are defined relative to us, but that's what we want to do. We're trying to figure out how our perceptual system works. Uh, final question, maybe. Um, I have just um, just a question concerning labeling. So labeling. Labeling. Yeah. Um, you, are, I find very interesting your um, explanation of the hierarchy of perception. Yeah. And um, you certainly will agree that um, human beings are able to. Um, to recognize another hierarchy of perception than, uh, than animals or yeah, other right. living beings. So how would you call the ability to combine basic features in order to recognize an yeah. opera or a, a Porsche 911 or something yeah. like this? Yeah, the answer is that we have certain uh, cognitive capacities and uh, many of those are a function of language. Uh, so I, I can see uh, I literally see uh, that this is an item of European currency, and that's not because my I have better, well, I don't seem to have any, oh yeah, here's one. Uh, this is an item of European currency, and I can see that, not just because of the basic perceptual features, but I know how these perceptual features relate to institutional structures. My doggy has better vision than I do, but he can't see that that's European money. Now, my guess is that working out that stuff is probably not a suitable uh, 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 process for philosophy because it involves too much neurophysiology. I mean, we just don't know how the collateral information enables you to identify uh, uh, this as a certain item of currency and that as a certain make of car and this as a, a certain a building. Well, maybe you could do architectural types. I mean, maybe uh, Gothic could be identified in terms of the combination of basic perceptual features. I haven't thought about it. But in any case, uh, I think there is a I, I, the, the basic message I want to get across to you is that you have to see the hierarchy of perception and you have to see the bottom level as somehow fundamental to the manifestation of the higher levels and then the higher levels have to top up. There has to be a, a top level beyond which it's not a question of vision but some other capacities are involved. So, yeah. Thank you very much.